Welcome, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Everybody, praise the Lord. I myself am privileged to be a servant of the church. And I pray that none of us will misuse the privilege in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this great occasion. Thank you for your children, for your servants, for the people you have chosen to lift up Christ in this nation. For every brother, for every sister, every minister. And we pray that your grace will overflow in every life. Impact your people with your power, your grace, your mercy, your love, even today in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. The sessions we have, we're talking about grace. We're talking about growing grace. Greater grace for greater impact in ministry. And today we're beginning with the message Great grace for so great salvation from the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 8, it says, By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. By grace are ye saved. That word saved gives us salvation. That means by grace we have salvation. And it is through faith. It is faith in God. And it says it is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Hebrews chapter 2. Reading from verse 3, it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape what? How shall we escape the judgment of God? How shall we escape eternal perdition? How shall we escape the judgment that comes at the end of a graceless life? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So great salvation. People can neglect. They don't reject, but they neglect. Why will anybody neglect so great salvation? Salvation, great salvation, so great salvation. Why do people neglect so great salvation? Because they are holding on to graceless salvation. So they think I have salvation already. Because they have a kind of salvation that does not come by grace. Why do people neglect so great salvation? They are holding on to fruitless salvation. A kind of salvation that bears no fruit. And because they think I have salvation already, though there is no fruit, they neglect so great salvation. Why do people neglect so great salvation? 
Because they have a meaningless salvation. The salvation that has no meaning. There's no godliness. There's no change of life. There's no transformation. Why do people neglect so great salvation? Because they are holding on to self-effort salvation. They try to produce salvation by themselves. By what they try to do. They do not visit Calvary. They do not look at the cross of Jesus. They do not lean upon the mercy of God. It's a self-effort salvation. And that one does not get us to heaven. Why do people neglect so great salvation? Because they are holding on to self Righteous salvation. They say, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do this, I don't do that. Because of that self-righteous salvation, they neglect so great salvation. Why do people neglect so great salvation? Because they're holding on to self-improvement salvation. They try to turn over a new leaf. They try to drop some things in their lives. That one is not good. That one is not good. And they're trying to empty the ocean of their sin by little drop, little drop, removing a little at a time, self-improvement salvation. That's why they neglect the salvation that comes from heaven. They are trying to earn salvation. They don't remember, they don't know it is the gift of God. That's why we're talking about grace in this first message. Great grace for so great salvation. And look at the last three words there from the Lord. Not from religion. From the Lord. Not by self-effort. From the Lord. Not by traditional religion. From the Lord. Not from my denomination. From the Lord. Not by changing my dressing, my outlook. From the Lord. Great grace for so great salvation from the Lord. We're looking at the message in three perspectives. Number one, God's provision of transforming grace for salvation. Number two, good perception of true grace for steadfastness. Number three, great possession through grace by saved souls. Look at number one. Number one, God's provision of transforming grace for salvation. So great salvation is the provision of God. And when it comes to our lives, it transforms our lives. And heaven declares we have salvation. In Titus chapter 2 verse 11. It says, for the grace of God. Not the grace of man, the grace of God. 
not the grace of a bishop, the grace of God. Not the grace of the soul winner, the grace of God. Not the grace of the gracefulness of man, the grace of God. God takes the provision of salvation from the hand of man, every man. No man can provide enough grace, enough mercy, enough love to save anyone. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. And he tells us in verse 12, he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. The grace of God brings salvation. That salvation, that grace teaches us. We deny ungodliness. And we deny worldly lust. And now we live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There is the experience of salvation. There is the evidence of salvation. There is the expression of salvation. Experience, evidence, expression. How do we see the salvation of the Lord in my life, in your life, in the life of anyone? Let's go through the Alpha and the Omega of the grace that brings salvation. A is the atonement through his sacrifice. In Romans chapter 5, reading there from verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's a sacrifice. And then in verse 11, it tells us very clearly, it says, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have who have received the atonement. He atoned for our sins. He died on the cross. And it is only through that atonement we experience salvation. Turning over a new leaf? No, no. Doing my best, trying my best? No, no. Atonement through his sacrifice. B is the birth by the Spirit. That's the experience of salvation. Born of the Spirit. In John chapter 3, looking at verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Of God. Can you imagine a baby being born by self effort? Can you imagine a child being born, a baby being born by personal improvement? 
we experience salvation by being born again. Born of the Spirit of God. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Self-righteousness is what it is. In the righteousness of self. Righteousness produced by self. Righteousness by self effort. The spirit doesn't come in. And except a man be born of the spirit of God, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. See his conversion is salvation. conversion that happens only through salvation. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Repent. That's direct. Be converted. That's indirect. Repent. That's what you do. Stand up, that's what you do. Turn, that's what you do. Go in a different direction, that's what you do. R repent ye therefore, that's what you do. And be converted. That is what another person does, another personality does, heaven does in your life. Be converted. That's what we have in salvation. The experience of salvation. Then it said that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The dry, dreary, weary land gets rain from heaven and it's refreshed from the Lord. D is deliverance from the uh, through the from the control of Satan. Experience of salvation. That you've been tied to a pole. Think of a goat being tied to a pole. The rope is on the neck. The other part of the rope is of the rope is around the tree. And that uh, goat might seem active. Can go around that pole. But cannot go beyond the length of the cord. Of the rope that binds him to that tree. Self-effort self will not release that goat. Personal improvement will not release that goat. Activities will not release that goat. Religious activity and the social activity. All those activities will not release that goat. It takes another person who is free to move to that goat and remove that cord from the neck. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, 
It says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, referring to Christ himself, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. See verse 15. And delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. That's the experience of salvation. That when that grace of salvation comes into our lives. It delivers us from the control of Satan, the devil. He is endurance in all situations. Without so great salvation, we cannot endure. A little insult, we fly up, we get angry. A little problem, we get into conflict and we begin to fight. A little difficulty, we give up, we give in. If I cannot be them, I join them. And so the world has so much pressure and so much pull that we cannot endure, we cannot stand. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Transgressions on the increase. Sin on the increase. Iniquity on the increase. And so people young and old, they join the people that transgress because the iniquity is abounding, the love of many shall grow cold. In verse 13, it says, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. There is present salvation. There's perpetual salvation when we already cross over to heaven. We are saved now by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the present salvation. But temptation will come. Trials will come. And it is the grace of God that says, my grace is sufficient for you. That makes us to endure the trial, the temptation, so that we have the final, perfect, everlasting, perpetual salvation when we get to heaven. The experience of salvation. F is freedom from all sins. In Romans chapter 6 verse 18. Being then made free from sin, we became the servants of righteousness. It is that so great salvation. Not a minimized salvation. Not a graceless salvation. Not a fruitless salvation. Not a meaningless salvation. Not a godless salvation. It is not a self-effort salvation. 
It's not a self-improvement salvation. It's not a self-righteous salvation. It is the so great salvation that gives us freedom from sin. Look there at verse 22. In verse 22, it says now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto uh, holiness and the end everlasting life. G is godliness with sobriety. It tells us in Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Salvation. Then in verse 12, it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. The experience of salvation brings godliness or sobriety. When salvation comes in, there's a seriousness and sobriety in our character. We're not superficial. We're not a clown. We're not going about joking about wine, about women, and about wealth. Our life has a sober, serious attitude. Salvation comes in, frivolity goes out. Carnality goes out. And being a friend of the world goes out. Each honesty in all sincerity. That's the experience of so great salvation. That our lives are honest. Dishonesty in business will go out. Dishonesty in interaction relationship will go out. Salvation comes in, it produces honesty in all sincerity. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in all in the sight of God. God will speak in Christ. I, there's imputation by the Savior. When we get saved, by the Spirit, by the grace of God, there is imputation into our lives. Our lives are no more empty. Our hearts are no more empty. In Romans chapter 4 verse 22. And therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness. The imputation of the righteousness of God comes into our lives. There is the experience of salvation in Christ. There's also the evidence 
we get saved and we have the evidence this is salvation. We're coming to point number two. We're looking at great good perception of the grace for steadfastness. True grace. That's false grace. The kind of grace that has no evidence. I'm saved. No evidence. I'm saved. No experience. I'm saved. No expression. But when we're saved, there is the evidence of that salvation. How do we perceive the true grace of God in anyone's life? We're looking at First uh, Peter chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly. It says, ex exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. How do we know we have this grace? The grace for steadfastness. J is the joy of salvation. In Psalm 51 verse 12. Psalm 51 verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Somebody says it. Saved is still gloomy. Still sad. He's thinking about all the punishment that will come in eternity. When we're saved, we're saved from the penalty of sin. We're saved from the pollution of sin. We're saved from the punishment of sin. We're no more in imprisonment to the devil. The prison doors are open. We come out of the bondage of sin. That gives us joy. The joy of salvation. That's the evidence. You know, I have the joy of salvation within I carry the joy of salvation around. And because of my name be written in the book of life in heaven, I rejoice. Then there is the kindness to saints and sinners. When we're saved, this is the evidence. God is kind to me. I am kind to others. In Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 12, it says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness and humbleness of mind. Then he talks about meekness and long suffering. Cruelty is gone. Secret and malice is gone. And we love the Lord. We love the Savior. We love the saints of God. And we love the sinners around us. When we get saved, there is the life in the sun. We're living uh, outside the Son of God. 
But now he says, I in you and you in me. Salvation brings Christ into us. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I will sup with him, I'll fellowship with him. If he abides in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask whatsoever ye will, and it shall be done unto you. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now we live in the sun. We don't bring dagger. We don't bring uh, any injurious implement or, or tool into Christ. Because now we live in Christ. And all those injurious things, injurious elements, injurious tools, they're taken away from our hands. We're living in the sun. Mercy towards the sad and the sorrowful. The Lord has had mercy on me. And so I pass that mercy around to the people that live around me. That's evidence of salvation. But look at that man going about, I'm saved, I'm saved. And it's merciless. He begins to beat the wife and can beat the wife to death. I am saved. There's no mercy. A little thing that a child has done at home, I'm saved, I'm saved. He takes out a belt or takes out a, he takes out a whip and whips that child until the child gets to coma. I am saved? No. The evidence of salvation, we have mercy on the sorrowful and the sad. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. In verse 7, it tells us, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. When we're saved, we have delight in nourishing ourselves with the word of God. Nourishment in the scriptures. You love the Bible. You love the word of God. You love to hear from your father. You love to hear from Christ your savior. And only way you can hear from the father is to go to the word of the father. The only way you can hear from Christ is to go to the word of Christ. That's what we're told in Acts 17 verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so.
You love the word of God more than your necessary food. More than breakfast. More than supper. More than any food you can use to nourish your body. The evidence of salvation. But somebody who doesn't like to hear the word of God. He doesn't like to come to church. He doesn't like to read the Bible. He can read all that literature, books, but not the Bible. Where is the evidence of his salvation? Evidence, nourishment in the scriptures. Oh, now we have obedience from the depths of his spirit. It tells us in Romans chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Before grace came, it was disobedience. Disobedience to the law of God. Disobedience to the law of the nation. Disobedience to the commandments of our parents. Disobedience against the authority around our lives. Now grace has come. Shall we continue in sin, in disobedience, that grace may abound? In verse 2 it says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Look at verse 17. In verse 17, but God be sang that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered unto you. That the evidence you have, the grace that brings salvation. What can you show for your salvation? What evidence do you demonstrate? Do you have obedience to the word of God from the depth of the spirit and your soul? Now we want, we go to the next one, which is peace in our soul. No torment in the soul. No agitation in the soul. No conflict in the soul. No, no tearing apart in our soul. In the secret, when you are all by yourself, you have peace. In the turmoil of the world, you have peace. In all the contradictory actions of people of the world around you, you have the peace of God. That's the evidence of salvation. Number one is the experience of salvation. Number two is the evidence that you are saved. In Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1, Wherefore, be justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Kill, there is quietness without strife. You have a quietness. 
and you have a silence. You're not agitated every time. Talk, 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 talk. There is that quietness in your spirit without strife. Abraham said, Lord, let there be no strife between us. The people who are not saved, they're interested in strife. If there is no strife, they initiate one. If there's no fighting, they start a fight. They're not happy except somebody is throwing a stone to another fellow. Salvation brings quietness without strife. And he tells us in the word of God. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 11. And that she study to be quiet. Endeavor to be quiet. And to do your own business. And to walk with your own hands as we commanded you. And we have righteousness without subtlety. Without cleverness. Without trying to defraud another person in a clever way. Without stopping the progress of other people in a, a kind of a crafty manner. Because there's no jealousy in your heart. There's no envy in your heart. And there's no the demonic uh, kind of approach in your life. You are not in union with Satan to hinder anyone. When you are saved, when you are born again, you have righteousness without subtlety. Look at this man in Acts chapter 13 verse 10. And said, Paul said, O fool of all subtlety, and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. When somebody is not saved, it's an enemy of righteousness. It's a child of the devil. Will thou not cease to uh, kind of uh, pervert the right ways of the Lord? When we have salvation, we have the experience, we have the evidence. Number three, we have the expression of salvation. We come to number three now. Great possession through grace by six souls. Six souls possess grace. Six souls possess transforming grace. And it's a great possession. Greater than any other possession they have in life. Great possession through grace by six souls. It tells us very clearly in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us. Made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Look at verse 8. It says, for by grace are you saved. 
through faith, through trusting in the Lord, leaning on the Lord, believing in the Lord. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, it now tells us that we are the workmanship and were created in Christ Jesus. Salvation brings a new creation. There is a new nature created within us. And it says we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. And we now express that salvation in our action. In good works. In gracious life. And now we have S, strength for steadfastness. We're not only saved for five minutes, we're saved and we keep on living as saved souls. One day after salvation, we're still steadfast. One week after salvation, we're still steadfast. One year after salvation, we're still steadfast. Because salvation brings steadfastness with the strength from above. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Ye therefore... Beloved seen uh, that she know these things before. Beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. In verse uh, 18, but grow in grace. The grace of God is there. Every new day, there is a new portion of that grace given to you. Every new challenge or situation in your life, you are growing in grace, and the grace of today will match the challenges of today. you have truthfulness in speech. When we're born again, our language will change. Oh yes, we're still speaking the same language. But there are some elements that are taken away from the language. Anger is taken away from the language. The expression of your speech it doesn't have deception anymore. It doesn't have any lie anymore. Because you are saved, then you have truthfulness in your speech. In Romans chapter, sorry, uh, Psalm 15 verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Who are the people going to get to heaven? Those who say, I'm saved. There's no experience of salvation. I'm saved. There's no evidence of salvation. I'm saved. There's no expression of salvation. 
Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle upon high, who shall dwell in thy holy hill. Look at, look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, He that walketh uprightly, and he that walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. And now we come to upholding by his strength. When we're saved, he upholds us. The devil would like to come and push us down. But the hand that pushes us to be steady is stronger than that of the devil. Salvation brings upholding by his strength. Isaiah 41, verse 10. He says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. We will have victory over secret sin. Secret sin. The sin in the secrets of the heart. The sin in the secret of your privacy. The sin that comes when you're all alone by yourself. You know, after all, you are not alone by yourself. Somebody is living in a room that is bought. And there is a secret kind of uh, camera in that room. And the camera is so hidden in the room that in, it doesn't know there's a camera. And it says, I'm all alone by myself. No, you are not alone by yourself. The camera of the Lord knows and can see through what's going on in the heart. I can tell what you're doing when there's no other person with you, but the camera of God is with you there. He knows the thoughts of our heart. He knows the action of our hand. He knows the plan and the strategy we're planning. He knows the reason why we're doing what we're doing in secret. And when salvation comes, we have victory over secret sin. In First John chapter 5 verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Then in verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. He also tells us now about the worthiness for heavenly splendor. Is the salvation 
the salvation of God that makes us worthy for heavenly splendor. Graceless salvation that will not do. Fruitless salvation that will not do. Meaningless salvation that will not do. Godless salvation that will not do. Self effort salvation turning over a new leaf gradually that will not do. Self improvement salvation that will not do. Self righteous salvation that will not do. The salvation that comes from God that makes us to live a life that is glorifying to Christ. That's the thing that brings the worthiness for the heavenly splendor. Revelation chapter 3 verse 4. There was a few names even in Sadis which have not defiled their garments. They do not allow the defilement of the world to splash on them. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And the ex is telling us about the expectation of his second coming. When you are saved, you are living in the expectation of the coming of the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you. And how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's salvation. With that salvation, look at verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Salvation gives us the expectation of his second coming. And why? Yielding the fruit of the Spirit. The good seed has been planted in us. We have salvation. Christ lives on the inside of us. And Christ begins to produce the fruit. Like in Mark chapter 4 verse 8. And it says, and the other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit, yield fruit, that sprang up and increased, and it brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And in verse twenty. It tells us the kind of fruit we are bearing. And these are they which are sown in good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, yield fruit, some thirty fold, sixty fold, and a hundred fold. This is the believer, the saved soul. By salvation, it begins to yield 30 fold fruit. Salut, 
His steadfastness and supplication is sanctified. Now he can yield 64. In the baptism immersion, uh, enveloping by the Spirit of God, it can yield a hundredfold fruit. And now we have the zeal in uh, soul winning uh, for the Savior. Born again, saved. Is now a believer. And we're told in John chapter 4, verse 28, that the woman left her water pot and went away into the city and says unto the man, in verse 29, it says, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Zealous of God works. Zealous of evangelization. Zealous in soul winning. Zealous in touching other lives and bringing them to the Lord. In Bastachi, we are told, then uh, they went out of the city and came uh, unto him. And then in verse 42, it says, and they said unto the woman, now we believe, uh, and it says, not because of thy saying, but we have heard him uh, ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Christ the Savior of the world as we pray we think about the grace of God the grace of God that brings so great salvation and then it works within us. You want to examine your life, examine your heart, examine your profession. You have the experience of salvation. Can you show the evidence of salvation? How do you express that salvation? You have the expression of the salvation. Let your light so shine. So great salvation. So great shining. Let your, let your light so shine. Before men. That they will see your good works. And glorify your father. Who is in heaven. Praise God for the grace he has given you. Praise God for more grace he will give you today. And all these will be evident in your life as you have more grace, much grace, and your life will bring glory to God and your ministry will be a fruit. It's time to stand up now and pray for grace, more grace, much grace. He loves you. He'll be merciful unto you. All the grace you need, he will grant unto you. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door of grace will be opened wide unto you. 